Okay, good. All right, take two. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well tonight. My name is Aiden Norman Cooper. I will be facilitating uh, tonight's webinar, um, which is uh, discussing sc uh, school wide enrichment model. Um, I am a uh, trustee uh, of the New Jersey Association for Gifted Children. And on behalf of the entire organization, um, I'd like to welcome uh, you all. So now I'm going to share my screen so you're able to see the uh, presentation. Okay. And I hope everyone's able to see that. Is everything looking good so far on your end, guys? It's fine on my end. All right, great. Then I'm, I'm going to turn it over to the presentation for uh, now. Okay. All right. So we're going to begin. Let me just. Great. Okay. All right, Aiden. So um, I'll go ahead and do this part. So tonight we're talking about the school wide enrichment model, developing talent for all students. And um, Joe Anzulli uh, has a wonderful quote, which is school should be a place for talent development. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Thank you. If you like to follow along and look at slides as we are going through the presentation, you can go ahead and take a picture of this QR code. So while you're doing that, I'm gonna take a minute and introduce myself. And then I'm going to ask the rest of the attendees to go ahead and introduce themselves as well. Um, my name is Connie Drake O'Brien. I am president of the New Jersey Association for Gifted Children. I am a, an SEM school-wide enrichment model specialist and a graduate of UConn. Mai? Hi, um, my name is Mai Chiku. Um, I'm um, co-founder of OTSM Squares in Japan. And I, I am a graduate from UConn. Hey, Kirsten. My name is Kirsten Hansenberg. I'm a fifth grade highly capable teacher, which is what they call gifted ed here in Washington state. I teach just outside Seattle for Mercer Island School District. And I'm also a graduate of UConn. Yeah. And Miet. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Miette Brown, and I'm a gifted education um, specialist for grades K through five in Denellen Public Schools in New Jersey. And she's our Fraser Javits Grant recipient here in New Jersey, which we're very excited about. Um, can we go ahead and process through to the next one, please? So the goals of the SEM. So SEM. What's the point of doing SEM? Well, SEM is about enjoyment, engagement, and enthusiasm for learning. And we do that because we want to increase academic achievement. We do this in the school setting, and that is what our job is about, right? We are trying to increase academic achievement. Next slide, please. And yeah. that's where we're going to um, we're going to talk about the school wide enrichment model. We're going to talk about the um, different structures, the school structures, the organizational components, as well as the heart of the school wide enrichment model, the service delivery components. Next slide, please. The service delivery components, there are three main parts of the service delivery components, and you are not seeing things. I don't want you to think your eyes are going crazy. There are lines there and pay attention to it because this is the beauty of SEM. SEM connects. That's the beauty of this. It all comes together. They all build upon each other. It's scaffolding. So the first thing, the service delivery components, there are three main areas, the total talent portfolio, the curriculum modification techniques and the enrichment learning and teaching. Next, please. With the total talent portfolio, this is where we want to collect the information about the student's strength. We will collect all of that, we will gather all of that information in one place. So that way we can make decisions about, the stu about acceleration or an enrichment in school or even in later educational and personal career decisions. Next slide, please. The second part of the service delivery components are the curriculum modification techniques. So when you're dealing with your curriculum, the heart of what you are doing in the classroom, you have to teach your curriculum. You want to make sure that you are adjusting the levels to challenge your students. 
you are also looking at increasing the depth and complexity of the content that's going on. And you also want to make sure that you have various types of enrichment within the regular curriculum itself. So many times we hear there's differentiation going on within our school system. But what is that? Well, there's curriculum compacting, there's increased depth of curricular content, and there's emphasis on complexity of curricular content. Next slide, please. And now we get to the heart of the school-wide enrichment model. That is the enrichment learning and teaching, my favorite piece of the whole thing. I love type one. Type one is where the gifted education specialists, they're coming into the classroom to expose all students to a wide variety of disciplines, topics, occupation, hobbies, places, events that they normally wouldn't um, be covered in the regular curriculum. I recently had a type one um, enrichment activity where I went into the classrooms and we talked about fossils and paleontology as a um, career exploration. There, the students had a virtual field trip where they we went to Australia, Melbourne, Melbourne <laughs> Museum in Australia to see dinosaur bones. How fun is that for <laughs> all of the students to actually go to Australia? And I even shared those links with the families, with the students and their families, so they can continue to have that type of enrichment at home and share it with others. Next slide, please. So type two, group training activities. So what are we doing in the type two? Well, we're taking whatever that first type one enrichment is. And now we're saying, what would a person who is studying bones, right? Animal bones, what would that person have to do? And how would that person feel as they're going through the process? What tools would they need? What type of education might they have? You know, where would you need to go and get this type of education? Would you need a paintbrush to be able to wipe off everything as you go through? And so you are giving them that experience, but you're also training them so they're able to move on to the next step. Next slide, please. Exactly. I love how all of this um, connects with each other. So first, the students have a type one, which is a general int introductory of the concept, and then they can move into type two to get a little more training and a little more study, and they can even continue into the type three. This is where the students self-select the area. So continue with continuing with the fossils and paleontology. So say the students really love the assignment and they could want to continue to study dinosaurs, find out all the different um, types of dinosaurs, the habitats, um, the time periods, and then create all of that into a book, writing about the dinosaurs, drawing pictures, illustrating the book about dinosaurs. This is where they create the type three, taking all of the um, knowledge, all of the skills that they have and putting it into a nice finished product, say for example, a book, but it can be other um, types of in products. They could uh, possibly have a play or um, they could, even, mm. well, I, I can give you an example of something that happened when in my district, we were learning about solar cars. Mm -hmm. And at night when the teachers came out, because, you know, teachers don't leave as soon as the bell rings, in case you didn't know that. And so at night when the teachers came out in the wintertime, it was dark and the teachers couldn't see. And so we took their knowledge of what was going on with the solar panels and they came up with putting up a solar light. Oh, I love so that. It was an opportunity for them to be able to extend what they learned in the solar cars because they're not building a solar car in sixth grade. I mean, they are building a small solar car, 
but they're not building a solar car for us to drive in. Maybe they're gerbils, but not for us. And yet they took the concept of the solar and put it out. So now the teachers had some place to go. Exactly. So that's where we have our type three activities. Next slide, please. School structures. The school-wide enrichment model has also school structures. These are the regular curriculum, the enrichment clusters. We're not gonna spend too much time on the enrichment clusters because Kirsten is gonna take us into depth of what the enrichment clusters are and the continuum of special services. Next slide, please. In the regular classroom, this is where all of the predetermined goals, the schedules, the learning outcomes um, happens. The SE influence of the regular classroom, that's where you will have the curriculum modification for those um, high ability students or even in-depth learning experience. All of this would happen in the regular classroom. Next slide, please. The enrichment clusters, or these are your non-graded, and again, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is where adults are working with students and sharing their own interests and expertise. Next slide, please. And the continuum of special services is just a nice um, infograph of how, how you see the broad range of special and supplementary, supplementary services that young people will um, receive or could receive. You notice it, it will start in the elementary grade and go all the way up to high school. So you'll even notice that there's the different components that we have already spoke about tonight. We have the general classroom where they're having the type one or even type two um, enrichment activities, even the curriculum compacting the modification and enrichment clusters. You will you see all of these services in the continuum of the special services that young people will receive. Next slide, please. Nothing can exist unless you have organization. If you don't organize, it's going to fall apart. So the organizational components, there are seven of them. Next slide, please. We have the school-wide enrichment team, which consists of the gifted and talented teacher or the gifted educational specialist. Also on the team, you can have teachers as well as guardian. We have the professional development staff model, which will help to better implement the um, school-wide enrichment model. It will better apply these techniques to the classroom, as well as we have the curricular materials and resources. I like to have this, um, these resources and material in a centralized location where there's easy access for the teachers to re get these activities and resources to make the differentiation possible in their classroom. Next slide, please. The school-wide enrichment teaching specialist, this is a person who has been trained. They have had some sort of gifted education training or an SEM training. And the school-wide enrichment model network, that's us. You are seeing a perfect example of four people who have connections with each other across the nation, across the world. And we network with each other and we talk about how are you using SEM? Next slide, please. We have the guardian orientation training and involvement. We want to make certain that we have guardians as a part of the team. And we are also providing them with resources and training so that they could um, assist their child at home. Of course, within our school, we have the democratic school management plan so that we are working towards a common goal for all. Next slide, next slide please. We're so lucky with UConn, they provide us with resources. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, can you back up for me, please? Matt, do you wanna to touch on these resources that we have available? 
Absolutely, thank you. Well, we have the Renzulli Learning System. That is an online platform system that the, um, students are able to go on and research um, topics or even complete projects using the Renzulli Learning System. We have the identification instruments, the curriculum materials. If you're implementing the school-wide enrichment model, if you go to that website, gifted.ucon.edu, you will find a wealth of materials that will help you with the implementation. You will find staff development and training materials, as well as evaluation instruments. Next slide, please. So. Oh. Why should you develop talent within your school? Because you want to meet students where they are. So many times students' potential is masked. And when you meet them where they are, you find that potential. We want to find students' strengths and passions, and we want to engage them. When you are engaged, you are learning and you are enjoying challenging students to spark the enthusiasm to get them moving forward and to expand their academics. So this was a very, very quick overview of SEM. <sighs> so I wanna thank you for allowing Mia and I to take you through all of this. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsten because what we really wanna do now is get you into some specifics of SEM. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Connie. Next slide, please. So I am thrilled to be able to share enrichment clusters with you today. Uh, we at our school just finished a round of enrichment clusters, and I'm excited to share with you how we put that together this year. I've been doing enrichment clusters for the past 17 years, and they've evolved and changed, and I'm happy to be sharing what I have learned over the years teaching gifted ed. So enrichment clusters are a high-level brings high level learning through common interests. Next slide, please. So who are enrichment clusters for? They are for students who are sorted by interests and the other who, the other equally important part are the facilitators. So those are adults within your school. So it can be school staff, you can use volunteers. We're gonna talk more about that as well. The what? It's a series of meetings over the course of six to 12 weeks. Ideally, you would meet for eight to 12 weeks, but I'm also gonna be honest with you as we go through here with the way that schools are nowadays, you get in what you can. Uh, we just did a six week uh, cluster here again at our school and that's what we could fit in. So again, ideally eight to 12 weeks is fantastic. If you need to use six weeks, by all means do what you can so you can share this with the students in your school. So. During this time, um, the adults, the facilitators are guiding learners to produce an authentic product linked to their cluster theme. And the when is weekly, ideally weekly for 45 to 75 minutes. If you can do it 60 to 75 minutes, that is best practice. However, again, while you're fitting in what all students, what all students need with other classes they need to go to, specialist schedule, things of that sort. If you can get in 45 to 50 minutes, by all means, take the opportunity to do so. And again, try not to skip weeks. Um, keeping consistency keeps the engagement high as well. Next slide, please. So the benefits. Enrichment clusters are absolutely fantastic. It's high interest and engagement. Students are intrinsically motivated learners. They are learning about a topic that they are already interested in. They can't wait to get there. You will have students from other classes come up and ask you in the hall, uh, when are we meet? What are we going to, what are we going to be doing this week? When are we meeting? Things of that sort. Again, really high interest. You are, you are working with the students and you are building 21st century thinking skills. And this is inductive learning. So it's student-led inquiry and investigations. And we're going to go more into that as well. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of enrichment clusters. Essentially, you can take a topic that you are interested in as a facilitator or 
topics that students are interested in and turn it into an enrichment cluster. So these are all enrichment clusters that we have um, given students the opportunity to engage in over the years. Again, recently, I just finished up an enrichment cluster on astronomy. I've done roller coaster design, getting the pet of your dreams, and you can see other options here as well. So really, sky's the limit on what you can have as an enrichment cluster topic. Next slide, please. So you're ready to plan your enrichment block. You've decided it's something that you really want to do. What's wonderful about enrichment clusters is that it can be for a grade level, switching students around, or it can also be across grade level. So most of the time that I've taught enrichment clusters, we've done grades three to five, mixing students within classrooms and within clusters. Um, this time, this year around, because of the way our school has been scheduled, we had our three fifth grade classes mix. So the first thing you want to do is identify staff who will participate. So oftentimes it's easy for teachers to come together who have similar schedules during the school day. But if you're lucky, um, as we were this year, we had five additional para pros that were enthusiastic about being facilitators for enrichment clusters, in addition to our principal this year, totally completely on board and wanting to also lead an enrichment cluster. If your school allows it, you can have volunteers come from the community or have parents involved. It's really whatever your school, uh, whatever your school allows. So what you want to do with the with the future facilitators is find out what topics interest them and what would they be comfortable facilitating. The next step is determining the interests of your students. So I like to use not only the total talent portfolio, but also an interest -alizer, which you can again find on the UConn website. You can take a poll with your students. You can also have them chart, simple charting on the board or on a sheet of paper of what they'd be interested in. Then you look over the list of what the adults would be interested in teaching in addition to what the students would be interested learning about. And again, I shouldn't say teaching, I should say facilitating with the adults. And then you combine interests of the students and adults and come up with the list of uh, interest or enrichment clusters that you'll be offering during the block. Next slide, please. The next thing you want to do is you want to create a schedule. So again, the ideal length is eight to 12 weeks, but if it, within your school schedule, you can do six, I would encourage you to start with that and try to build upon that later on with other enrichment blocks down the line. Again, each the length of each session should be 45 to 75 minutes. You really get a good chunk of time if you can meet for 60 to 75, I'm sorry, 60 to 75 minutes. But if you can only do it for 45 or 50, definitely use that time as well. You wanna choose a day of the week and the time of the day that you'll consistently meet or that works for everyone's schedule. And then you go ahead and you assign students to clusters. What we do is come up with a blurb for each cluster, or the facilitator comes up with a blurb for their cluster. And then you have a list for the students to look at. What we've done here is have the students rank their choices by interest level. So we were able to offer eight enrichment clusters this time. So students ranked them from one through eight, from highest interest to lowest interest. And we all worked, the, the three teachers worked very hard to assure that each student uh, were, was enrolled in either their first or second choice. One or two were in their third choice, but that was still way above the lower end of the list. Then you wanna distribute learners into groups of about 10 to 15. It may vary again on how many facilitators you have, but you want a smaller group so you can really work with students and really dig in on the topic they're interested in. And again, mixed grade levels work really well. I get, I've in back in, in previous years, having grades three through five worked really well. The fifth graders were often mentors for the third graders. And you can also look into having clusters for, for grades kindergarten through second. I'm an elementary educator. Um, these again would work for middle school or high school depending on schedules. So I can see even doing a, a sixth through eighth or a ninth through 12th, again, depending on the high school or middle school schedule. 
Next slide, please. All right, you've chosen your topic, now what? So developing your enrichment cluster. Next slide, please. So the difference between an enrichment cluster and a mini course is that you are facilitating an opportunity for students to dig deep into areas they're interested in. You're not coming to you're not coming together once a week and teaching facts in a traditional um, school environment. This is a chance again for students to use those type two skills that Miet and Connie talked about before, and also taking an interest for the type one activities and really again digging deep. The students are leading the path and you're working your way towards a final product. Whether each student wants to have a final product or the group wants to have a final product, that's again up to the students. These are the key questions to consider when you are developing your own enrichment cluster before you begin meeting. So what do people with an interest in this topic do? So for, interest, for, for example, with astronomy, what does an astronomist do? What does an astronaut do? Go through, think about what people who work with astronomy do, what are their jobs, and what do they do within this topic? What products do these people create or what services do they provide? You're going to take this information to the students within your cluster. What methods do these professionals use to facilitate their work? These are the types of skills that you're going to be promoting within your cluster. What resources and materials are needed for quality products? Again, you're going for high level quality products with your students. How can results be shared with an authentic audience? So in addition to your final product, well, that the students are going to be creating, you wanna have an authentic audience for the students to present it to. And how will you explore these ideas with your students? So you wanna sit back, Think about how you're going to cover these different questions and facilitate that learning with them to make this a rich, engaging time with your students. Next slide, please. So again, don't forget, you are the facilitator and the encourager, and your role is to help students locate resources and assist, and assist them into how to use them not to teach traditional fact-filled lessons. Those are mini courses, and this is an enrichment cluster. Next slide, please. What you wanna do before the students choose their enrichment cluster is you wanna come up with an intention, with an attention catching blur. So you wanna skip using verbs like learn. You wanna ask a question that gets them thinking and you wanna describe what students will be doing. So here's an example of what I posted and put together for my enrichment cluster this time on astronomy. Oh my stars, do you wonder what's beyond our planet? Are aliens real? Would you be willing to take a one-way trip to Mars? Come explore planets, galaxies, black holes, and more. So all the facilitators come up with their blurbs Again, you put them, you compile them on a sheet or, how, or you can do it online, whatever works for you. And so students can have an idea of what will be happening. And again, it's a way to really grab their interest. Next slide, please. Okay, the students have chosen their clusters. They've been assigned. You're getting together. You're meeting for the first time. The first thing you want to do, because again, you're mixing groups. Best case scenario, again, we had five fifth grade classes meeting this time. In previous years, I had we've had up to five classes of third through fifth grade combining as well. So you want students to know each other and feel comfortable, especially if you're doing um, across grade groups. The third grade, the younger kids tend to be a little bit intimidated by the older kids. So you want them to feel like one cohesive group. So you wanna learn one another's names and have an int introductory activity, kind of an icebreaker that ties in to what you're doing. For instance, if you were doing something on anthropology, you might wanna have a box of tools, a mystery box of tools, pull them out one at a time. 
and display them and talk about how the tools are used by, by professionals in the topic you're covering. Okay. Ask the students what they're interested in and exploring on the cluster topic. So again, this is different than this coming. I think we may have lost you temporarily. Yep, I think we lost Kristen. Okay, um, would, Connie, would you, would, would any of the other panelists like to pick up where we uh, left, uh, left off? Um, can we just give her about 30 seconds? So I think what's really interesting about this is uh, the concept that this is so different than a mini course. So we're so used to talking about mini courses within uh, a school setting. And mini courses, we are that sage on the stage, right? Sitting there teaching the students what's going on. And what's so nice about um, an enrichment cluster is the students are guiding us through this process. And at the end, they are presenting. Oh, hi. Go, go for it, Kirsten. Nice to have you back. Sorry about that. No problem. I can hear you saying you lost me, but um, can you tell me where you lost uh, the, me? Uh, we were, the students are, I think you were just, you were bringing out the tools and then you were going on to step three. Oh, great. Thank okay. you so much. Sorry about yep. that. So ask the students what they're interested in exploring on the cluster topic. You're not coming in with a, with a list already designed of what you're gonna study during each meeting time. The students are guiding what you'll be focusing on and guiding them to research. So allow students to choose a subtopic they wanna pursue. And then you wanna brainstorm possible performance products or services and, authentic, and the authentic audiences they want to present to. Next slide, please. Here's what I did on my first day meeting with my cluster. I asked them what they wanted to learn about astronomy and you can see their ideas that they came up with. And we used this to guide the rest of our meetings. Next slide, please. Here's the most important part about enrichment clusters. Again, they're not mini courses. This is an opportunity to dig deep and you want to figure out what skills will your students need to create their final product performance or service. So for example, again, this is really tying in the type two types of um, experiences that we talked about early in this, uh, in this talk. So here's an example. So I had an enrichment cluster on owning your dream pet. So the, the skills that, this, that we worked on that I helped the students with were researching their pet's needs. They all had an idea of their dream pet. It needed to be uh, in, this, in this particular time, a realistic, something you could actually own that was legal. <laughs> um, what was the life expectancy, the lifestyle, what supplies did they, would they need for the pet? What was the pet's temper temperament? Did it match with their temperament? They interviewed a professional. So someone that was knowledgeable about pets. So they needed to practice interview skills. They needed to come up with questions. They needed to analyze the monthly cost. So they looked up how much a pet ate, what type of food, any other supplies the pet needed. And they came and again, they came up with an analyzation, an analysis of the monthly cost. They needed to map out a daily schedule for pet care, how much time it would take, including other personal responsible responsibilities they had with sports and after school activities. Then they needed to create a persuasive product to present to their parents and they practice public speaking. These are what they came up with and what as we went through the different the different skills they needed to come up to their final product. So I am happy to say that out of the cluster of 15, one student convinced her parents to get her a hedgehog because she proved she knew what it entailed and she was, and she was showing she was responsible. So these can work. Next slide, please. The five types of final products they can be artistic products. They can be performance products, spoken products, 
written products. They can be models or construction products. Again, the students are choosing what type of product they want to use as a culmination for the enrichment cluster. They can choose independently. They can choose in a small group. They can do a whole group. It's up to them. Next slide, please. You wanna then celebrate your success. So when you finish your enrichment cluster, have the students present their final products to an authentic audience, or if they've decided to provide a service, they need to go ahead and do that. Consider an enrichment cluster showcase. If you have time during the school day or perhaps after school, have a chance to have the parents and the community to come in and see what you're doing. Invite parents, administrators, the local newspaper, and have students and facilitators complete evaluations at the end to build on your successes and also refine weaker areas. Next slide, please. I gave you a really quick overview of a class that I took for two weeks when I was at Confertute. For more in-depth information, this is a great resource. I do not get any sort of um, any sort of uh, payback or anything for for any for um, recommending this book. It's a fantastic book that goes much more in depth on how to run enrichment clusters. And next slide, please. And I cannot recommend highly enough uh, Confertute 45, which is an either in-person or virtual learning through UConn this summer. You can see the you can see the address at the top or the link. And this is where I learned about enrichment clusters and I brought so much back to my school and my classroom learning about SEM and all the ways to really bring high level learning to the classroom and the school. Next slide, please. All right, I am so excited. Oh, I'm sorry, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me anytime. I am happy to talk to you and communicate with you if you have any questions about enrichment clusters. All right, I am so excited to introduce you to my Chiku. I was lucky enough to be put together with my in our grad program at UConn. We, I had the opportunity to be in the three summers program with her and she was absolutely remarkable. She will tell you more about her background, but she started writing a blog about gifted students in mm. Japan and, how, and meeting their needs. And now she has gone on to be the only SEM specialist in Japan, and she's co-founder of Weichi SEM Squares in Japan. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my Chiku. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, as Kirsten said, I am Mai, and then I am the uh, co-founder of OT SEM Squares, which is an SEM-based micro school and after-school enrichment program located in the Tokyo metropolitan area. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about my, well, about my work and experience, experiences as an SEM specialist in Japan. But before I get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and my um, background. Um, next slide, please. Yes, um, <clears throat> I am a parent of a son who has been identified as gifted in California. And he's a college student now, but it was really hard to find a better fit education for him both in Japan and, and in the US. It was actually harder um, in Japan because gifted education doesn't exist in our country. So no one, including educators, <clears throat> psychologists, or my friends and family understand, understood the needs of my son. So that led me to look into American gifted programs that was um, back in 2013, like 10 years ago. So, um, we tried various gifted programs in the US, um, such as online programs and online schools for accelerated learning and summer, camp, uh, summer camps for enrichment activities. Um, but none of them seemed to work well enough. And um, Kay, uh, my son, uh, gradually became depressed as a result of that. Uh, next, next slide, please. 
So at the same time, I learned that there were many children in Japan who, um, just like my son, were suffering because they didn't fit in the rigid one-size-fits-all education system. So Kay was lucky enough to have had a choice and receive education in English since it happened to be his first language. But um, most Japanese children don't have that luxury of having access to um, such resources. So um, that's what led me to this path. I uh, wanted to get the skills and knowledge to allow myself to better advocate for my son for starters. Um, and I also thought that with this new knowledge that I gained at UConn, maybe I'll be able to help other Japanese students and families in similar positions as well. Next slide, please. So in the process of learning about SEM, I wondered if the type three project could work in a homeschool setting and decided to perform an experiment. I facilitated K through the type three enrichment project as a practicum assignment and tested to see if it worked better than acceleration and other enrichment activities he had received in the past. Um, the experiment was a huge success. K felt in charge of his own learning and had some sense of accomplishment for the first time, and something that traditional methods of learning could never provide him. So since then, as is the case with many students who have undergone type three, he has gone to college in the field he explored, which was photography, and is about to pursue his career as a photographer. Next slide, please. So I started to promote SEM in Japan while I was at UConn because I was fascinated by its concept, especially the three E's. And the fact that Kay's academic and emotional needs were met by SEM and the success of the experiment acted as further encouragement to share this new way of learning with Japanese families and educators. So um, what have I been doing? Next slide, please. Well, first, I give, I give presentations and seminars whenever I have the opportunity. I talk about how gifted education, talent development work in the US, Joe Renzilli's concepts on giftedness, and what SCM is all about. I use various um, mediums such as blogs and social media effectively, maybe. And with my colleagues, I hold workshops and provide individual support and guidance for parents who want to facilitate the enrichment trial model at home. I also wrote an academic paper. It has just been published recently, and I look forward to making it easily accessible for anyone who wishes to see it. Next slide, please. So when Japan finally started to address the need for gifted education last year, um, Dr. Renzuli, Dr. Reese, and Dr. Sigley helped me out by participating in interviews about the effectiveness of SCM in public education. The interviews posted as a series of YouTube videos were well received, and we've heard many kind words from parents who said they were encouraged by the professors. Um, also, one of the leading researchers in the field of gifted education in Japan has promoted these videos on official forums. So, um, although it's a small step, we are gradually gaining recognition. We hope to spread the concept of SCM further with the eventual goal of having it adopted in the public school system. Next slide, please. So, um, since 2017, we've been promoting SEM using every possible medium, but we gradually realized that it was not enough. No matter how many seminars and workshops on SEM we, we held, um, few parents actually tried SEM at home. The reason was that they were too busy or that their children, children would not listen to them if their parents were the facilitators. Even if SEM is good on paper, if it can be easily realized, it means very little. That's when we decided to create a space where we could help children with SEM directly, leading us to launch OHSM squares or OSS for short. Next slide, please. Um, 
the um, OT in OTSM squares means at home. So OSS means a small community or micro school where kids get together outside of regular schools and explore and develop what they are interested in through the enrichment triad model. The word squares in OSS was added with something similar to a town square in mind, where students are free to come and share their interest and whatever they are working on. Uh, next slide, please. So um, OSS is not an accredited school. We decided to start small as we have only three instructors and I'm the only SM specialist we have so far. So each of us have uh, our own role within the school and I work as an SM specialist. I'm in charge of its promotion and curriculum design. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what students can experience at OSS is the enrichment triad model. So we provide type one, type two, and type three enrichment experiences. In order to develop the um, TTPs or ta to total talent portfolios, we could uh, we conducted well, we conduct thorough interviews with each student who joined the program. So there are only three students working on the type three projects so far, and I'm personally in charge of facilitating them. And type three students typically have their families involved as well. Uh, all students, including type three students, participate in type one enrichment activities. Um, though all OSS students already have their own interests, we still allow them to explore new topics by, uh, for example, hosting virtual visits to the zoo, aquariums, museums, and also by doing show and tells and other miscellaneous activities that improve, you know, that improve thinking skills. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in addition to regular class periods, we try to have one in-person creative activity event per month. So in May, a Scotch tape craft workshop will be held with an actual OSS student as an instructor. So um, our plan is to hold more events like this, um, where a type two or type three work by a student acts as a type one experience for other students. Next slide, please. So future plans at this time include a SEM, SEM fair in June and, S, and an SEM summer camp. And the fair will be held at a location that's not yet decided, but will also be held online at the same time. And next slide, please. So for our summer camp, we have plans to work with a baker in the countryside over 400 miles away from Tokyo. Uh, students will undergo the valuable real world experience of making bread from scratch. Um, next slide, please. So one of the pitfalls of the current system is that we can only meet at designated class periods through Zoom. So in the future, we'd like to implement a system where students are um, perpetually in our virtual virtual space where they are free to share their work or perform other activities whenever they want outside the class class time. And next slide, please. Okay, my biggest dream though is to one day have a visit, uh, have a joint US-Japan SCM summer camp. The students in the host country would brainstorm creative ways to accommodate the visiting students. This would work as a real problem, which the students would then solve. The visiting students on the contrary will undergo type, type one um, firsthand by authentically experiencing the various activities the host country has to offer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think we are running out of time, I think. I think this is about it. Yeah, yeah, so um, Maya, if you could just uh, um, uh, finish things up and then we'll get into the uh, Q&A portion, that would be helpful. Okay, uh, the next slide, please, then. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this year, our Ministry of Education, aware of the problem, started to reform our system to better accommodate students with unique learning styles through the use of differentiated instructions and collaborative learning. These students under the current system are mostly uh, left out. The course taken by the ministry has a lot of shared concepts and principles with SEM, 
So although OSS isn't a government entity, we are looking forward to um, continuing doing our part to promote it at a grassroots level. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. And um, at this point, folks, um, I want to stop my sharing of the screen. And what I would like to do now is I would like to open up the floor for uh, questions and answers to our panel. So you are more than welcome to type, um, uh, uh, excuse me, you are more than welcome to type out your questions or if you would like to speak, you have the ability, I believe, to raise your hand and I can um, have you speak. So I'll give everyone a moment to type something out. I do see one question or one statement, I believe, a couple of things. So let's go to the uh, chats first, and then we will um, discuss uh, um, uh, the answers for this. So uh, Marquita asks, how does the facilitator support students in identifying what activities need to be part of their exploration, especially when working with students with limited exposure to a variety of careers, professions, or specialized interests? We introduce new areas of exploration through type one activities, but some students, and in some schools, it may be majority of students, may not have a foundation to draft from or the self-confidence to suggest things that feel so new. So that's a really great point. Uh, panelists, does anyone want to uh, jump on this question? Marquita, that's a great question. I'll jump in if everyone's okay with that. Uh, so during the meetings, especially during your early meetings, during your enrichment clusters, um, Brainstorming, having the students use um, technology to look up, you know, who, you know, looking, look up to see who uses astronomy, what professions are tied into astronomy, or whatever your enrichment cluster is. So you can use that. You can use, I'm sorry, the janitor's vacuuming in the hallway, but the door's closed. So I'm sorry if you hear noise in the background. Um, for instance, uh, as an introductory activity, you can also show a video of, of people completely you know, doing their jobs, things of that sort, using those tools that you brought in the box things and things and things to that effect. Um, having discussions. It's okay if you bring information to them, but you want the students to also come up with questions to lead what you're doing from week to week. All right, well, Kirsten, okay, I have a question. Kirsten, um, would it be possible, or at this point, would you bring in someone who is working as an astronomer or someone who's interested in this particular uh, career? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? So it's a great way to use your social media as a facilitator. If you don't know anyone offhand, what I've done in the past, I've said um, I had a I had one student doing a project with plastics in the ocean. So I reached out on Facebook. You, I'm thinking you can even reach out on LinkedIn and say, does anyone know someone who deals in this profession or in this topic. And you get all kinds of people reaching out to you and connecting you. So you can do you can do Zoom calls. If they're in your area, you can have them come to your classroom during your enrichment cluster meeting. And again, having students talk to that authentic person really brings the really brings the conversation alive and really brings the topic alive for them. Great. Thank you we, so had, we had a section one time I was working with some math students. My daughter was studying at Penn State. She was a math major and we would call her up at school, you know, on the cell phone. And so we were bringing the mathematician student into the classroom. So that was, you know, kind of an example. She was maybe not an expert, but she was studying it at the time. Thank you. Hey, I'd like to get to our next question. So this was uh, someone uh, uh, that wrote in anonymously, and it is the following. I love this model for enriching education for all students, but my district wants to use this as the sole model of serving gifted students. I understand how this could allow for natural differentiation as a gifted student dives deep into their topic, but I'm failing to see how this meets the needs of a student who is gifted in multiple areas and capable of both learning in greater depth than the New Jersey standards and learning the material more quickly. Does this model replace strategies such as curriculum compacting and cluster grouping or would SEM be used in addition? 
Um, and this discussion uh, is in the planning stages within this district, uh, just as some background information. I'll tell Ben for a couple of parts on this. Uh, this is certainly not the only path that you should be taking um, for addressing your students. Um, the reason why I jumped on this is because this is New Jersey. And in New Jersey, you need to take multiple paths and you need to be addressing your students in more than one way. Um, this is certainly can be used in combining this with other ways that you are addressing your gifted students, but it should not be the only way of addressing your gifted students. So if you have a student who is gifted in more than one way, you need to be, make sure that you are addressing their needs where they are at according to the standards, because that is the law in the state of New Jersey. I don't know if I answered that fully, and if not, go ahead and ask me another question. Be more specific. I will do my best to answer that even more. Okay. We do have another question. Um, Marie uh, asks, just to summarize, students would select topics that they are interested in and lead to discussions and lessons. Would there be any instruction from the facilitators? I would imagine that it would be ideal for the facilitators to be highly familiar with the topics. Is that right? Do you want me to take that one? Have yes. Take so students are choose so students are choosing the cluster they want to be in, and then they are they are registered for that cluster. Once you get into the cluster, what you want to do is ask them within the topic, "What are you interested in?" Um, and again, you can brainstorm as a group, um, things of that sort, just to find out where you want to go with your cluster during the time that you have the block. Um, there is instruction, especially when you're working on those type two skills. So for instance, if they, if you're writing a play, if you're doing a cluster on writing a play um, and putting everything together, you're going to need to break down those different skills that they need. And again, have them brainstorm. You can also add to it and say, what about this? And any skills they don't already have, that's when you facilitate and say, hey, let's talk about this. This is how, you know, this is how you would do this. This is how you would approach this. So there are chances to go ahead, to go in and, and teach those type two skills um, to help them out. And again, tying in the type one activities that Miat was talking about. Again, bringing in different speakers or different professionals, different experts in that topic is also a way to help students. Okay, I believe we have time for one more question, um, if there are. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any more. Oh, okay, we, I think we have one, uh, one more, some time for one more question. So. Uh, this uh, uh, Verlaine or Verlene, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, um, asked this question. Um, SEM would be new to my district. What are the best steps to take to introduce and advocate for SEM, particularly in a district whose primary focus on the needs of special education students, but does not prioritize the needs of gifted education or gifted students, excuse me? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Miet, you up for that one? Absolutely. I was just thinking uh, um, a nice way to advocate for the SEM is just by starting with the type one. So there you could um, promote that you are giving enrichment for all students, not just the gifted students, but for everyone, because everyone will be able to um, benefit from the exposure from the topics that you bring to the classroom. And you can begin as a pilot. That would be a nice way to pilot the SEM model. And then from there, begin to expand and moving to the type two, type three, as well as the enrichment cluster. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> the, the enrichment clusters. Um, piloting is a very, very nice way to advocate for the SEM model within your schools. All right. Thank you for that. Um, okay. We have a quick little question in that I think we can sneak in very quickly, and then we will have to um, unfortunately uh, end for tonight. So the question Nancy asks uh, for my specifically, um, could you talk a little bit more about type three in homeschooling? Uh, 
Um, specific. Um, I don't know how, <laughs> Connie, Connie, can you help me with that? Yes. Uh, how do you use type three and homeschooling? Oh, um, it's because homeschooling is to just to focus on your ch child. So it is pretty easy to, you know, like, um, to facilitate type three because type three is just, you know, for, or it is for one individual student or a small group of people of students so i just you know you, you just choose one person right as a type three and just do my, um, let me let me rephrase this my I, i'm not sure if this is what you were asking i'm sorry if i'm i'm saying this wrong but i'm going to try to rephrase this for my mind do you think it's hard for one student to do a type three or do you think a student would be better off doing it with friends I really think it depends on that child, but my my son really um, enjoys doing it by himself because it's, he he can focus on his own you know, like interest. So I find it easier to do it. I don't know if I if I rephrase that. Maya and I had talked earlier that sometimes <laughs> um, communicating between the Japanese and the English we <laughs> were trying yeah. to to make that work. So I hope I did that correctly for you. One more thing I'd just like to mention, folks. Um, Karen asks an administrative uh, related question. Um, she is interested in wondering if uh, she can get credit for participating in this. Is that something that's uh, currently being offered? That's a really good question, Karen. Um, Karen, reach out to me and uh, I will I will help you with that answer someplace. So okay. um, can we go back? to well we don't need to go back to that slide can can you type in here someplace aiden question yes. answers whatever my email address Drake of course C at njgc.org of course absolutely i i am doing that right now the while i'm typing this one thing i would like to discuss is, is that this has been um such an enlightening um webinar um and and one of the great things about this is is that um uh, and, and I'm glad Marcelo just asked this question. How do we reach out? Well, you can actually go on to the website, um, njagc.com. Uh, uh, or is it dot org? Dot org. I'm sorry. Yeah, dot org. Okay. <laughs> I should know this. I'm, I'm a trustee. Oh, my God. Um, so you can <laughs> go to um, uh, 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 njagc.org. And from there, you will find... Um, all the contact information. You will find contact information for Connie. You'll find contact information for myself. You'll find contact information. You'll be able to not only explore what we um, are all about, but some of the initiatives that we're working on. And as always, we're always looking for uh, new members, volunteers, and uh, anything uh, in between. So um, that's something to definitely consider. There's a lot of benefits uh, to uh, being a part of uh, this wonderful community that we really have. So, um, and right now I'm going to ask each one of us to type our email addresses into the chat. Whoops. Absolutely. And just one more thing I want to um, add for as an added resource gifted.yukon.edu is a wealth of resources if you are if you would like more information i know they even have an online sem um, class that you could take and there's a, i think there's about 8 modules and it will go through each aspects of the sem model from the clusters, from um, curriculum compacting, the overview in general, I believe it is a very, very valuable resource. Again, that's gifted.yukon.edu and you'll be able to find um, information there. And Mia, I don't think there's a charge for that, is there? No, it is free. Although they only offer it uh, twice a year, they have it in the fall and again in the spring, but please go check out that website and you'll find so much information. Oh yeah, Connie, yes, she has the book in her hand. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> That's well, love that book. <laughs> uh, another question that was um, asked was, uh, will we have access to this recording? Uh, Verlaine uh, asked this question. So I will answer that question for you. 
So you have access to this recording if you are a member of NJAGC, because these webinars are provided at, there's an expense for us, obviously, for NJAGC in order to put these out there. And so if you are a member, it is free to you as a member. So join NJAGC. Um, I have a quick question, Aiden. I am typing my address in, but it's not showing on the screen. Is it going directly toward to the question, the person that asked the question? Um, I, didn't see it. Um, that's, I didn't even actually see it. Um, you're more than welcome to um, type in uh, uh, the email address again, or if you'd like, um, are you, can you tap it in the webinar chat? Do you know if you're able to do that? Where it says chat, and then it should yeah. say hosts and panelists. And uh, Karen, um, who asked uh, uh, about the participation uh, uh, credit potentially, it just mentioned that she's actually going to be going to the uh, conferenture, uh, conf conference, conference, I can't say that, virtually this summer. So that's that's a, a, an excellent uh, uh, thing. Um, and I see, if, folks, if you look in the uh, webinar chat, not the Q&A in the chat, if you're able to see that, um, Kirsten just wrote her uh, email um, uh, down. And uh, so we have um, uh, Connie's email down. We have Kirsten's email down. Can't type into the chat box, only the Q&A. Okay, but are you, do you, do you folks know if you're able to see the webinar chat? I believe you are, hopefully. Okay, Mia, just uh, put her information down from NJAGC website. I'm glad we're having this conversation. It's very nice to see um, uh, uh, people very interested in um, our organization. So, um, okay, um, I'm seeing a lot of people that are typing in their emails. I think that um, what I will do, Connie, is I will uh, copy uh, yeah. the emails um, that have been sent and I can disperse them uh, to you and to whomever so there can be uh, potentially further outreach. Does that sound good to you? Absolutely, Linda. Okay. We. Uh Thank you for letting us know. You're not able to see the chat. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is if we could just take two more minutes, a lot of emails are coming in. If anyone wants further outreach to speak to Connie or anyone from NJAGC directly, please type your emails in now so I can copy and disperse them. Um, you're also more than welcome to directly uh, check out the website um, uh, for all of our contact information is there as well as who we are as an organization. And you can go to uh, njagc.org in any web browser. So let's take one other minute and type in your emails if you'd like. You're, you definitely do not have to. Um, and I think we will uh, close um, everything up. Okay. Wow, we got a lot of emails. This is, this is really great. I love that. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, you are seeing what I think are three fantastic people. And I'm so happy that they agreed. Noelle, I, you know, I, I love you guys. I am so happy. And Aiden, too, a fourth one. I am so happy that you all agreed to participate with me because I sent out these emails and said, hey, what do you think about doing this, guys? Aiden volunteered to help us out. And I really, really appreciate that. This has been a great experience for me. And uh, Aiden, I'm turning it back to you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all. I still am needing to uh, stay on a little bit just to, um, let's see, uh, to just copy those emails. It's taking some time. So folks, if you, you're more than welcome to stay on for a few minutes so I can... Um, uh, uh, type it, just copy all the emails in. But at this point, uh, the webinar has concluded. So I'm going to stop recording. Um, I'm going to do that right now.